So we are going to be talking about the last season. As you guys know, we've been talking about seasons for three weeks now. Now we are in week number four. And when we talk about seasons, we're talking about the seasons of the year and seasons of our life. And we've covered spring, and we've talked about summer, and then last week we talked about fall. So of course, this week we're going to talk about winter. So of course, today's a little bit grayer and rainier outside. I ordered that, okay? So I'm really glad God did that. But we're going to be talking about winter today. And the idea of talking about these seasons is to make us a people for all seasons, right? Not just a man for all seasons, but a woman for all seasons, a people for all seasons, that we live well within each and every one of these seasons. We recognize that each one has its ups and its downs, and we recognize that each one is temporary. There's another season coming, and we remember that other people might be living in another different season of their lives, okay? So as a recap of where we've been before we talk about winter is spring, we talk about being intentional, okay? Where you plant your time, where you put your resources, be intentional where you do that. Don't peak in high school. Keep growing, keep learning, keep challenging yourself. At all ages, we can be more and more like Jesus Christ. Avoid the thorns of the world. The world's appeal, their definition of success and wealth, avoid those thorns, especially during times of spring. Stay rooted in the word. This book is the most important resource that you have in each and every one of those seasons. And last but not least, tell your story. You are a walking parable. Make sure someone knows your story, at least someone, right? Summer recap. It's awesome. Appreciate the abundance. Appreciate the warmth, but do not idolize it. It is just one of four seasons. And to help you do that, look for God's daily provision in your life as you head out of summer into those other seasons. And remember... Others are in other seasons. So just because things might be all good for you or me might not be the same for someone else. That takes listening and that takes empathy and care and concern to make sure you're there for people in those other seasons. Like maybe someone who might be in fall. So this is a season where things aren't going so hot, okay? It is okay to mourn. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry. We talked about that, but don't do that alone. Don't do that alone. God calls us to mourn and share together in those seasons of fall, seek God. I mean, do it in all four seasons. But especially when things start to go down, seek the Lord with all that you have. And if you want something to boast about, to look for, to bring you up out of it, boast in understanding or knowing who the Lord is. Boast in Him, not in anything that we have to get you out of that season. Now, like I said, we're going to talk about winter today. And the passage we're going to talk about, I think, fits perfectly. It actually is Jesus in winter. We're going to talk about John 10, 22 to 39 and get a glimpse of what Jesus does during winter. But before we do, there are a couple of scenes I want to show you guys. Go back just a second. Oh, you already know. So what I want to do is we talk about winter. Many of us, I think, almost automatically think about Christmas and New Year's and we get really, really excited about what that is. And then some of us think about winter and a whole different side of it. So what I want to do first is just show kind of the classic winter scene. I'm going to give you a heads up, okay? If you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life, you're about to see the end of it, okay? So spoiler alert, go ahead and roll it. I don't know about you guys, but I have trouble watching that scene and keeping these eyes dry. One thing that's really important you got to remember if you've seen this movie, that incredibly joyful scene follows probably the lowest moment in that man's life. Remember that as we talk about winter today. For many, there is great joy, and for many, there is great trial. And moments like that often follow those low, low winter scenes. Okay, now for those of us who, when you think about Christmas and winter, maybe have an alternate view of what it's like to get everybody together for the holidays, I got another scene for you. This is from Christmas Vacation. We're going to have a wonderful Christmas. So today, as we look through this passage, I want you to be open. There are some of us who think about this season, and it is phenomenal. And there are those who think about these periods of time or these periods in their lives, and it is really really rough. And I think we're going to find Jesus in a challenging situation today. But when we think about winter, I think there's a couple of things that we all generally think about to describe it. Usually, unless you live right on the equator, right, it is cold. It is time when the temperatures drop, we start to see snow, we start to see ice, and things get a little bit cold, a little bit brisk. Many of us think about winter as that time at the end of the year, okay? And for the end of the year, oftentimes it causes us to look back and say, oh no, look at all the stuff I didn't do this year. And now I just got a few more days, a few more weeks, a few more months, and this is it. But I want you to remember something else about winter. 
It also happens to go into the beginning of your new year. Winter goes right over into a brand new year, a season of hope, a season of potential, followed up by spring. And one more thing about winter that I think we as people need to learn more from the animal kingdom about is this. It is time to sleep. Can I get an amen on that? The animal kingdom has figured this out, guys. Did you know there is actually an animal that their heart temporarily pauses and stops all winter long? Because they literally sleep right in the snow. And the heart shuts down just for winter, and it wakes right back up in spring, and they get on with the rest of their lives. Winter is a wonderful time for us to pause, rest, sleep, and break. And we're going to see a little bit of what Jesus does here at the end of the passage that relates to that. But the start of what happens to Jesus here in John 10 is a challenge. And I think winter comes with a lot of challenges. So let's look at John 10, 22 to 30. At that time, the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. So I want you to notice where Jesus is and what he is doing. He's at the Festival of Dedication uh, you might have heard the term Hanukkah or Feast of Light. It's all the same thing, okay? He's at this ceremony. What that ceremony there? It's an annual festival to commemorate the purification and rededication of the temple by Judas Maccabeus, and that was started back in 165 B.C. So Jesus is there. He's at a festival of dedication of a temple, right? He's there to honor the temple, to honor the celebration. And what happens? He gets dishonored. This is just like a winter situation, doing the right thing and getting hurt because of it. So Jesus is there to do the right thing, and he gets dishonored and challenged. And the challenge that he gets is a very, very serious question. I think it's a little bit mixed. If you, if you look at most English translations, they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you look at the original Greek and translate this literally, it says, until when will you take away our lives? These Jews are intensely concerned about this Jesus. And they're saying, if you're the Messiah, that is going to radically implicate our lives. Until when will you take away our lives? This is a very serious question. And in response to this very serious question, Jesus gives them a very tired answer. He says, I, I've told you, and you do not believe. You guys ever been there? where you've just told someone over and over and over again, and you're like, I don't know what else to tell you, right? Jesus is acknowledging a very basic principle that there's just times you're not heard. Some people just won't listen. It doesn't matter that you're telling the truth. It doesn't matter how many times you've told them the truth. They're just not gonna listen. And so Jesus inevitably says, look, I'm not gonna worry about getting into a war with words with you. I just want you to look at how I live. There's a discussion that happens here about looking at his works. This is a very convicting, I think, challenging reminder for us. When you're with that person who's just not listening, stop talking and start living. Just stop talking and start living. Maybe they won't listen to the words that you say, but they probably will listen to the way you live your life. And Jesus says, I'm not going to get into this with words with you guys. I just want you to look at my works. I just want you to look at who I am. He says, a hearer follows. Someone who knows me, one of my sheep, I will know that it's them because they hear my voice. A shepherd knows his sheep as the ones that follow his voice. Think about this. Picture a shepherd out in a field, tons of sheep. The shepherd says something, and the sheep that are his will come. Not because he's given them a good name or they've got a right tag or anything like that, right? Right? They only come because they know and follow his voice. And the shepherd knows they're his because they respond to his voice. If we are Christians, this should be convicting for us. This means if we are sheep, if we are followers of Christ, we are going with 
his voice, and we've got his voice. It's this. It's his book. Jesus says, if you are followers of me, you will listen to my voice. And we have his voice in the form of a book, and we need to be following it. And Jesus says to us, focus on the Father. He says that his focus on the Father, which I think in times of winter is especially important. When things are incredibly low, incredibly challenging to focus on the Father. And I want you to notice what Jesus says here in verse 29. I'm going to read it again. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. He says, what my Father has given me is greater than anything else, and no one can take it out of the Father's hand. Once we proclaim that we believe in who Jesus was and what he did, he says, no one's taking that away from my dad, my father, God. What Jesus did on the cross was great enough that once we say, I am in his hand, no one is going to take that away from us. And at times of winter, I think this can be particularly valuable. It might be the only thing we have to hold on to. So Jesus says, focus on the Father. Now, rejection is coming for Jesus. I want to read through that in 31 to 33. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus replied, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answered, Is it not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. I love Jesus' question. God's got a sense of humor. Jesus has a sense of humor. He says, whoa, 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 hold up. Which of the good things that I have done are you going to throw stones at me? He's acknowledging that he is being rejected for a good thing, right? It's not about what he does. It's for whom he does it, who he affiliates himself with. And guess what, folks? The promise was made to us that this type of thing is going to happen to us. Not because we're doing good things, but because of who we are doing them for. Jesus actually promised us that we would be hated. That was the word, hated, because of his name in Matthew 10, 22. So don't be shocked when you're trying to do a good thing in the name of Jesus and you are rejected for it. Yes, it's hard, but yes, Jesus promised it would happen. And I think it happens in those times of winter where you're doing everything right, but everything is going wrong. You guys ever had those moments? Where you feel like literally there's nothing else you could do. You've done everything right, and you're almost being punished for it. Everything around you seems to be caving, and you're like, I don't know what else I can do. As I thought about this, I thought about this question. This is probably an age-old question. I think that has challenged people of faith. It might even challenge you. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Anyone have the ready answer for that on the tip of your tongue? Fallen world? Yep, free will? Yep. So I don't know the perfect answer to this one, okay? But I do know that we know several things about who God is and who we are and what good is and what evil are that can help us understand these types of situations. So I don't have the perfect answer. But I want to explore just some of the things we've learned just this year through the book of Genesis and what we've studied about why maybe, maybe, bad things happen to good people. Perhaps it's because we know God is good, right? We know when God created and everything he created was good from Genesis 1. And then we're told in Luke 18, 19 by Jesus that Jesus said only my father is good, okay? So that means by definition that we are not. I'm not. People are not. We are not good. And in Romans 3, 23, it makes that incredibly clear. We are not good. So God's good, we are not, and yet God allowed for the existence of bad or evil. We know that from Genesis 2, okay? We're not going to argue about why, okay? That is something that God did, and we know he did it because the existence of that tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 2. And once it was exist in existence, he told us not to take from it, and yet we did. People exposed ourselves to evil. We know that from Genesis 2. And then, once the first person exposed themselves to evil, you know what they did? She exposed the person with her. And that's exactly what we do. Once we are exposed to evil, we have this tendency to share it, almost like a virus. And we expose other 
people to evil. And pretty sure, pretty soon, all that happens is you see bad things starting to happen to good people. And it just takes off and it spreads. Now, when you're in those moments, in those lows, I can tell you guys from my experience and from learning from the experience of others, there is one question that can be very important for you to ask. How can God use this? We might not know why we're in those low moments, but if you ask this one question of yourself, of God, say, God, how can you use this situation? I have been amazed at the number of people who have come through winter and now they're in spring and they're in summer and they look back at that low season in their life and they say, I was amazed to see how God used that. If this is you, ask this question. If it's not you yet, awesome. But when you get there, don't be afraid to say, God, this is, this is low. It's the worst I've ever been. How can you use that? And then live yourself into the answer. Watch what he does. Now, another thing we get to do in winter, this is one of the reasons why I like winter as opposed to the heat, heat, heat of summer, is we can bundle up, right? When it gets cold, you just put layers on as opposed to summer. When it gets super hot, there's only so many layers you can take off, right? It's like, just give me in water, get me in air conditioning, like it is hot. But when it is cold, we can just cover ourselves up. Now, we can do that physically, but spiritually, that's what we're talking about this morning, right? How can we cover ourselves up? We get to cover ourselves up with prayer. Cover yourself in prayer in those low, low, low moments. You and others, cover yourself in prayer, in communication with God. And yeah, he can handle if you're upset. He can handle if you're sad. He can handle if you're angry. Just don't walk away from it. He can handle your pain and your angst and your frustration. He just wants you. So cover yourself in prayer at those low, low moments. The Word, this book, we already talked about it, right? This is Jesus' voice. Cover yourself in the Word, especially in those times of winter. It will hopefully give you a glimmer of perspective on why maybe you're going through that situation. And then don't forget others. Talked about this a little bit with fall, right? Mourn with others. In times of winter, when we're especially low, Cover yourself with the support of other people. Don't try to do it alone. Think about if you've ever been cold in a room and you get people around you and the temperature of that room automatically goes up because you have people around you to warm you. That's just what we do. It works for the outside. It works for the inside. Don't try to go through winter alone. Good news. There's an escape coming up. We're going to get to learn about what Jesus does. Let's look at 34 to 39. Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If those to whom the word of God came were called gods, and the scripture cannot be annulled, can you say that the one whom the Father is sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said, I am God's son? If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. So that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Then they tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their hands. First thing I want you to notice Jesus does, and this is a brilliant thing to do, by the way, if you ever find yourself in an argument, is he uses their own words against them. And what he says to them, he says, doesn't your words say, I said, you are God's? Now, to understand the power of what Jesus is doing here, I want you to see that part of the Bible he's referring to in context. What Jesus is doing is referred to what we think about as Psalm 82, 6. I want you to see that in context. I'm going to read you 6 and 7. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. This passage is proof that God has a sense of humor. We got some cool sarcasm in our Bible, folks. What the psalmist is saying here is saying, you people who refer to judges as gods, because that's what they were doing. People actually considered that judges were so important, they were calling them gods with a lowercase g. And the psalmist is saying, you people who you consider gods, fine, you're going to pass away like everybody else. You are not really gods. It's an attack on these unjust judges. And what he's doing here is a rabbinic argument that would have been very, very familiar to the people who just challenged him here in the temple. The rabbis did this all the time. They would argue from the lesser to the greater. They would make an argument here and they would 
expand it out to here to prove a larger point. And Jesus is saying, look, if you say in your word that people can be called gods, what's the problem with me saying that I am God's son? And they don't have much to say about this, of course. And then Jesus says, all right, whatever with the words, I want you to look at my works. Just look at what I do. Verse 37. If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. He says, whatever with the words, whatever with what I've said, whatever with the words, just look at me. And do I look like a representative of God? Now, this to me is somewhat challenging. I want you guys to think about it this way. Are you comfortable being evaluated by the world for what you do? Are you comfortable the world is watching, not necessarily what you say. I don't even know what's going on up in here or in here. But they're watching what you do. Jesus was comfortable with that. He said, just look at who I am. Just look at what I do. I hope I look like a Messiah. I hope I look like a representative of God, like God's son. This is what the world is looking at in us. Are we comfortable being evaluated by the world for what we do, believing in our work? Now, I have to pause. We're talking about winter and acknowledge that winter witness, in my experience, is perhaps the most powerful witness of all. You get a chance to witness to the goodness of God, and you got four seasons to do it. When we do it in winter, those low, low moments of our lives, it is perhaps the most impactful. I know for me, the moment God got a hold of me was in winter. It was the lowest moment of my life, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard that story. When I found Jesus, I was at my lowest moment, and he picked me up, and he brought me into spring. And I know from some of you, and some of you are in here right now, you are a believer, and yet this is low. You are in winter, and yet you still testify that God is good all the time. And those of you in winter who testify to the goodness of God, please know your witness is such an inspiration. It is to me. Imagine what it is to those who don't believe. So when you find yourself in winter, don't forget to testify to the goodness of God because the power of doing that when we are low is incredible. Now remember how this section, how this story ends, right? Jesus escapes. He gets out. When we're in these seasons of winter, it is okay to retreat. It's okay to take a break, right? How many people go south when it's wintertime? It is okay to take a break, to rest, to help make us get through that winter and get into that next season because remember, it's coming. I want you guys to notice what we've done in the last four weeks. We have gone in a full circle from spring to summer to fall to winter and just at those coldest moments, all of a sudden, it warms up blooms come and spring is coming in this world or the next spring is coming life has this incredible cycle and circle and when we learn to live within that i think we'll live more at how god wants us to live in his world now as a reminder every week we've tried to go over the things we've learned about each season so as a reminder what we've covered today when in winter right expect challenges when they come be like yep jesus told us there are going to be challenges, there are going to be trials, and then live out your answer. Don't worry about arguing it out, just live it out. People will see that better. Don't forget to ask this question. How can God use this? At your low, low moments, how can God use this situation? And think about it this way, we talked about your winter witness. Witness high even when low. Even when we are at our lowest moment, we have the greatest potential to witness to the greatness and the highness of God. And it is okay to retreat and take a break. Okay? We're going to take communion like we do every single week. And as you think about communion, I want you to think about what we talked about today with that cycle and circle of life. That in winter, we have both the end of one year and the beginning of another year. Only God could do that. To take an end and make it a beginning. I think that's exactly what he did in what Jesus did on the cross that day for us. Think about it this way as we go to prepare our hearts for communion. The end of Jesus' life was the beginning of ours. Let's pray and then we'll take communion this morning. Father God, we thank you that you created the world and our lives in seasons. Periods of time, 
with their ups and their downs and perspective and view on how to get through each and every one of those and people around us to get through that with. And God, we thank you today for the reminder that there are challenging, challenging times. And it's in those times that we have the potential to give the greatest witness to who you are. And as we think about those challenging times, we have to think about Jesus. And Jesus, as we take communion now, we thank you so much. As we take the bread, we remember the body of Jesus broken for us. As we take the cup of juice, we remember the blood of Jesus poured out for us in your winter. And as you ended, Jesus, we began. We thank you for your love and for your goodness. And it's in your name we do this.